your political point of view to somehow treat you as a lesser citizen, which goes against everything we are as an American. Yet at the same time, they'll be the ones to come out with chest thump and chest down that they are somehow for Americans for something. And that's it. So first, let me tell you, I am one of those women who never worked a day in her life. I am one of those stay-at-home mothers. I was like, man, no. Is this okay? Can you hear me? I'm pretty loud. So, I, I totally reject the idea of feminism and what it's become. I think gender and identity politics is truly idiotic. I have no need to have some politician come talk to me because he's understanding and empathizing with where I'm at in life. I'm not interested in helping my personal group, class, race of people. In fact, the entire country, the civil rights movement, was about overcoming the idea of class and race and gender discrimination to just be every individual has the exact same right. It doesn't matter. Rich or poor, black or white, it doesn't matter. But of course, in liberal ideology, it matters very much, and here's why, and you need to own this and live with this for the rest of your life. The reason liberals live in the world of feminism and identity politics and black versus white, rich versus poor, women versus men, the reason they live there is because they can't win on fact. In the arena of ideas, they cannot win. I experienced it myself on Monday night. I was live on national television. I infuriated a liberal with a fact, one fact, so much that he told me live on national TV, scream, you don't know what that F over you you're talking about. Because he couldn't overcome my facts. Not me, not my wit or brilliant, nothing about me. Fact, couldn't trump it, they never can. So they will personally try to destroy. And one of the ways they do it is this lovely thing called feminism. And every time you have a woman's day, how many, how do you, you guys watch, I don't know what news shows you watch, but you hear, oh, women's issues. How many hear the phrase women's issues? Yeah, newsflash. There are no such thing as women's issues. All issues are women's issues. Why the, the same people who claim there are women's issues are the same people that believe women should be allowed to go everywhere and women, women's freedom. Well, then stop talking about there's certain issues women can and can't talk about or authoritative on. Ridiculous. Reject it. First, embrace it to be able to get into the public arena to debate them, then reject it and tell them they're ridiculous. And never be afraid to tell them they're ridiculous. So as we all know, Sandra Flocker Fluke is now saying that women, um, basically painting the picture of women as on bended knee to the government for free abortions and free birth control, as if, and giving great credence to the things Bill Maher calls us. The very words they don't like being called, they paint that imagery with their hysteria over the need for every woman in America, and that every woman is dying for free birth control and free abortions. Well, reject it, reject it outright. So I did free market feminism to give the voice of women who, like myself, believe it, not in free things, freedom. Not in free things, freedom. Because they look to the government for their answers. We, those of us who believe in freedom and understand liberty, know that any time the government is going to be able to come in and tell you what to do, it's going to start ruling your life more and more. There is no freedom in going on bended knee to a government for the things you need. So, free market feminism, what is it? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not that musty old feminism that all these so-called modern feminists, you know, the man-hating, tree-hugging, robbering feminism. I reject it outright. I mean, this is what the movement was founded on. And Martin Luther King once said, and I'm paraphrasing, the arc of the universe tends towards justice. And if you look at women in America, it's true. We were invisible in society. When, when we first started, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband when he was down. Um, during the revolution, um, and, he, and they, they were busy repairing, writing the declaration, she said, don't forget about the women. Because back then, as soon as you married, and you married young, it usually was some type of either an arrangement or approval by your family, you disappeared. Women were invisible. And as women like Elizabeth Candy Stanton and all came to the scene, and by the way, those women like that, they worked all of their lives and they never saw women get the right to vote. Women women who were there in the beginning, fighting for women to be treated not as a class of people or a particular gender, just as people, just as individuals. So that arc 
for women is true. There was a need. And then in the 60s and 70s, there came this idea that it's not just that women should have the right to vote. Women should be treated like all individuals, period. And the feminism, the, the movement back then, started out okay. And then it turned in, you know, Lynn Cheney, who, um, do you know, are you familiar with Lynn Cheney, the former um, Vice President Dick Cheney's wife? Brilliant woman. She had, a, she had a PhD. And in the 60s, she got a PhD. And she went for a job. And the guy said to her, well, ma'am, I see you're married. She, he said, so are you married or are you serious? He said, I can't give you a job. My mother, went, when my father and her went to get a loan in a bank, the bank off, my mother made more money. And he said to her, I, he said, I, and he was younger than my mother. He said, I'm not counting your salary because you're just going to get pregnant and have babies. And my mother accepted that because at the time there was nothing she could do that was legal. So there was a need in general for political push. The manner in which the feminists then hijacked the movement and used women to advance a radical, left-wing, anti-American, socialist agenda is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the rights of individuals. And that's what I want to talk about. You cannot take a stand on an issue until you know your principles. You cannot be for something until you know what it is you are at the core, so that when you're looking at an issue, you know what it goes back to. So here's, my, here's what I would say to you. When you are determining and looking at social issues or economic issues and trying to decide what is the proper role of government, I mean, people always say to me, well, you hate the government. No, I don't hate the government. Government belongs in its rightful place. We need government. We we're not anarchists. So how do you determine that? Well, we did a really great job with short little documents back in 1776. And we laid out our founding principles. And it is this. We hold, first of all, we hold these truths to be self-evident. So therefore, we don't, you don't need a government for these core principles, okay? We acknowledge to ourselves, we hold these to be self-evident. So we don't need like a big government telling us, this is what you need to know and be. We hold, we're, it's self-evident, thank you. That all men, and in that phrase, what America became is taking that the idea of now the universal man, right? When we say, I always refer to men, you know, the universal man, meaning it includes all genders. We hold, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, not born, created equal. Created equal. Created equal. And they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So the other principle, the government doesn't give us our rights. I think one of the big things about feminists is they're always crying to the government, our rights, our government doesn't give you rights. It is yours. From the moment of your creation, we acknowledge this. This comes out of the enlightenment with John Locke, and you need to push back on that. Any anytime you are challenging a liberal or a leftist or a socialist, the number one thing you have to ask them, one thing, where do our rights come from? These rights are always claiming that conservatives are taking from them. And they'll probably say government, most of them do, they're very uneducated in this matter. To which then you have to tell them, fine. I will then take over the government and take away all your rights. Because if we do believe that our rights come from government, then we can take over government and take away people's rights. Yeah. Our rights are endowed to us. They were given to us. So I believe in economic freedom. And I think the greatest thing for women and men and children is freedom. And I am not just standing here giving you my opinion. I am telling you all over the world and throughout history that economic freedom is the basis for everything. And all other freedom, prosperity, the way to live, health, everything you want and believe in your life does not come from socialism or a government. It comes from economic freedom. So I want you to look at these two lists. Now, just go through the countries. Who would like to live in any of the countries in Colombia? No, no one for Chad? No, the Congo? No one would like to live? How about Myanmar? No one for Venezuela. Okay, Kalamak, who would, does anyone want to live in any of the countries in Kalamak? Obviously we live in America, so. United Kingdom, so if I had, to, if you had in your life, you had one choice right now, you get to pick a column and you can live in any of those countries, but you gotta to stick to that column. Would anyone choose column A? No. Okay, and, okay, just out of curiosity, why? Like, any reason, any, you pick a country, anything, go ahead. So they're economically depressed, they're in the third world. The third world. Well, there's a reason they're third world nations, and it's not because we didn't have
have enough movie stars and singers bleeding about it up on stage with songs like We Are the World, which was catchy, by the way. The reason is those countries, and I will be show you this, lacked the things, lacked their five, five points of economic freedom. They lack all of them. They fall at the bottom of all of them. And because of that, you will see, they fall at the bottom of everything else. Infant mortality, life expectancy, everything. Gender equality. It's there because of their lack of economic freedom. They lack everything else we care about in life, too. So when these feminists or radical left-wingers start selling you, take them back to you, ask them to go and live in it. And this is not because America has too much. That's the other, oh, we have too much, we're all. These people are oppressed because they do not have the indicators of economic freedom. So as you guys all know, um, <coughs> I was here back in November. Were any of you at the event we did on um, energy? You were the elders, so you remember. So I have a new one. So do you remember Ann McElhenney? She was here, she's Irish. And when we were talking about feminism and why, and you know, how do we explain economic freedom? It's such a lofty idea. So Anne spoke at one of the Americans for Prosperity Foundation's events, and she gave a brilliant speech, and she explained the fraudulency of feminism and the whole idea that we're revolving around birth control. Like, all we have to give the people in Chad and in Africa are just some birth control, let them have fewer kids, and they'll live just like us, and we, like, we get on our bikes or run in hamster wheels. So really, that's the whole philosophy. So just listen to what Anne said. I thought it was just so, as she would say, bloody brilliant, but she is. So. There should be a screen there to press the volume control. Not that one, like by the computer. more new clothes. Okay, you buy a lot more new clothes. And then what would you do with the new clothes? You just keep throwing them out. And then your money then would all be go towards what? New clothes. new clothes. New clothes. So either all your time, so if you didn't have a washing machine and you wanted to go to class and you wanted to be educated and you wanted to go out with friends or you wanted to go out to work, obviously basic hygiene, health, are tied to the cleanliness of our clothes. I mean, if you wore clothes for two, three, four weeks, 
five weeks at a time without cleaning them or any ability to clean them or to spend time on it, it not just becomes a hygienic issue where people don't like it, it becomes a health issue too, right? So the idea of cleanliness and clean clothes, and clothes are harder to wash than bodies, affects a lot of aspects of life because either you're going to spend whatever money you're earning not washing clothes to go buy new ones, which was a fair point. Of course, that is assuming you have places where you can buy clothes and that you don't make your own because then that too would be. Or if you have zero access to washing machines, you then are using all your time to go and physically and manually clean your clothes. And I think this is a brilliant point. So in 1904, Americans started getting um, washing machines. Um, and it was electric. So before that, women were washing their clothes down in a river with rocks. And then, and I do have a point, these people are looking, people always say, why are you talking so much about washing machines? Because it's going to point, the washing machine is directly tied to economic freedom. I'm going to tell you why, and to government and policies. So before this, women in America, before there was electric, they washed clothes, they went down, or they paid, if they were wealthy enough, they paid someone to do it. And then there were machines, someone invented it in America. And the women could stand there and do this. So it was time and it was labor, but it was not as much labor and not as much time. So women started getting more free time. And then in 1904, boom, the latest housewives can do washing in one third the time. And all of a sudden, women had time. They had more time, 1904. Is it any surprise that this was the rise then of the early feminist movement? Barring Abigail Adams ready to her husband. The rise of the feminist movement started with what? The washing machine, because why? Because women had what? They had time. They had time. They had freedom. The number one, there was a study done by Dr. Frank Luntz, and they put up on the screen, what do women care about the worst? Well, what, what is the number one concern of women? That they, if they could have something, would they have no more worry? No, would they have more money? Would they have more time? Or would, and there was a couple other. The number one thing in this country women want is time. Because it's directly tied to our freedom. We sometimes might not connect that, but it is. So boom, here we go. So here are these women in chat, right? Look at this. This is what women have to do in chat. They don't have time. If you gave them birth control, these women are still doing this, okay? Birth control isn't gonna go wash their clothes. This is still happening, it's time. Now let me directly tell you why and how this is tied to politics, issues, and economic freedom. Did everyone here, did you study the kitchen debate? The kitchen debates, you did. Yeah, you want me to push you on it? I wrote my thesis on Nixon, actually. You wrote your thesis on Nixon. All right, good. All right, I'm going to go. Now you're going to be part of the presentation. What's your name? Mike Rogers. Mike I'm Rogers. I'm uh, history and education major. Oh, I love it. That's what I want to <laughs> But uh, you're all flyer up, so that makes me like you. <laughs> so why don't you tell the crowd, what, tell everybody what the kitchen debates were. So and, and just quickly, Nixon was president in 59, and Khrushchev was the premier of communist Mother Russia, the USSR. Okay, so go ahead and tell them what happened. Well, President Nixon basically told him that like the American kitchen and the American way of life was superior to that of the, of the Soviet Union because of capitalism and free market. Right, right. So just to repeat that, what happened was Khrushchev, we actually did not like communists back then as America. Um, we did not believe in it. We knew it was a direct and sudden an ever-present danger to our way of life. He never went. And we were determined to beat the Russians. Now here you have two men, two powers of the world. They both had nuclear arms by this point. And there was constant mortal threat from each one of us that one was going to take the other out. And so Nixon, and I know not a lot of, not a lot of people positive or bullish on Nixon ever, but I will say, foreign policy-wise, he's quite liberal in his uh, domestic agenda, but foreign policy, this was... In my, it was vice, he was vice president. I'm sorry, he wasn't president. Yeah, That's why I was. Yeah, saying. he was. Under I knew he wasn't. Uh, yeah, 59. he was in '59. He was Eisenhower was president, so Nixon hosted Khrushchev. That's my fault, and I knew that too. Sorry, um, my mother, my father was so appalled when we were now. So <laughs> Nixon was the, the vice president. So here you have this secondary and the, and the head, and the head of state, the second head of state, and the head of state, and the not the thing. That Nixon shows, the, the Americans show, the Soviet premier, the communists, is the American kitchen. And they, Nixon starts lecturing Khrushchev about women and American women. And he says, our women are far freer than yours. He, and he shows them the kitchen. He goes, women in America have time. They have things that can be done for them that have traditionally held women down. And 
And in our country, under freedom, under liberty, our women can be free. Yours, yours barely have electricity. You, because of communism, and I am paraphrasing here, by the way. This is not Nixon's speech. I'm paraphrasing. This is what he's telling Khrushchev, though. If you go back and read the transcript, he, he says our women can be, have freedom, and yours are washing clothes by a river and have no chance at economic prosperity. And the Soviet premier scoffed at him. He was rude, Khrushchev. And, he's, and he's, he made a comment in Russia, and he said, well, does, does the American government have things that can pick up the food and shove it down their throats for them and have it swallowed, which is a typical communist model. Number one, he assumed that it was the government that made that American kitchen. It was not. The government had nothing to do with it. It was private industry. It was individuals who invented, created, and continued to improve these things. It wasn't government. And furthermore, it's so typical of the communists that they cannot understand this idea of freedom that to them, the ultimate asset would be for have a machine put out by the government that could feed people and shove the food down. So the people had absolutely no control. It's just so telling of communism versus freedom. And I thought Nixon, he was a real hero at this moment, even though no one ever remembered it. And he said, and I love this quote, to us, diversity, the right to choose, the fact that we have 1,000 builders building 1,000 different houses is the most important thing. We don't have one decision made at the top by one government official. And that's his president, Richard Nixon. It was not. He said that as vice president. I didn't do the slides. I had technology, so I apologize. <laughs> um, I mean, think about those words he used. This is 1959. The idea of diversity, choice, these were not hot topic words. They were not hot button words. They were meaningful ones, unlike now where they have been hijacked. Diversity is not about the color of your skin or where you're from. It is what you get and what you want to choose and that you are treated equally in your rights. And the diversity is in all the offerings before you, the extra. And the choice, it's all about choice. And the choice that Americans had was that we get to choose what we want and people weren't dictating.
to reconsider how we live our lives, changes things, and causes us a lot of grief is, and I know you all are going to agree with this. Let's connect ourselves, my friends. The biggest problem facing women, oops, is, in fact, now I say that, okay, does everyone know what most guys are like, what are you, some guys are like, what? Is an older man, an older guy is like, that is wonderful. what is this show? So that's from the show 30 Rock, by the way, you guys want you want. The, the muffin top is when, if you button your pants and your belly spills all over it, it's known among the most women. Muffin top, we all hate it. With all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. No women talk, like when we get together, our discussion, birth control, please. Flab is what we talk about. I mean, you know, government stops that. I might start thinking of becoming a socialist. But the, 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 the point is that a lot of the idea of muffin top, and no, it's not, if you think in the context of is this a major issue in social? But it again speaks to economic freedom. Because on the cover of Forbes this year is this woman, and I'm confident none of the men know who she is, but you should. She is America's youngest and first female billionaire. Self-made, self-made. And you know why she is the world's, the America's youngest, actually she's the world's Youngest self-made billionaire, female billionaire. The world's youngest self-made female billionaire. She didn't inherit it. There are a lot of female billionaires that have inherited their money. She did not. Self-made. And what did she make? She cured muffin top. Well, she didn't cure it. Which she reigned it in. She reigned in flat. She created specs. Who knows specs? Do you guys know what specs? I love the looks on guys' faces. Spanks are, pro it's basically girdles, but for the modern, modern women, okay? It's made of this <laughs> tight material. So this is a woman who, 10 years ago maybe, was selling fax machines. She, but she had a problem. And her problem was that every time she wore a pair of pants, she could not put on nylons because they covered her toes, and she liked her toes to show. But and, they, and, and the nylons came down past the pants, and it was a funny look. And, but she liked how it sucked her in when she wore the pants. And this bothered her a lot, clearly. So here she's out selling fax machines. She's annoyed that she's like wearing pants and looking ridiculous with the nylons. Or she's wearing it without oh, the muffin top and the bulge are going over. So she decided to find a, a solution. She started cutting nylon. She started playing with the fibers. She did all sorts of things. And then she thought she had a good idea. She figured something out that would, would bring this in for her. So she bought a book on how to patent it, and she did. And the next thing you know, she's on Oprah, and this is less than 10 years ago. And Oprah says, this is the greatest, she, Oprah finds this product in a store and says, this is the greatest thing ever. Here's another one. Again, neither one of these women, and you'll notice this, were government bureaucrats. Neither one of, none of these things were commission studies or anything. It's just two women. One woman found the other woman's product, held it up and said, this is awesome, and it solves my problem of fat and flab, and I love it. And I want everyone to go out and buy this. And this woman said to herself, oh my goodness, I gotta get in touch with Oprah. And then Oprah brought her on and launched her business. None of this was done with them. There, we have a government. The government gives us peace. Peace keeps us safe. But these women, Oprah and Sarah, Sarah Blakely, created what they did because they had the freedom to go out to solve the problems they wanted to solve, to fix things they cared about, and not what the government deemed was best. Because let's not kid ourselves. If there was a government commission and, they, and it was taken to them like, we need to solve muscle and talk. First, they would commission a panel. But first, there'd be a debate, like, oh, the Republicans just hate women, and how dare you? And then on the left, they'd be like, I don't think we should talk about how a woman looks. You know, it shouldn't matter how a woman looks. And then there'd be a call, and there'd be a committee hearing, and people would come out, and then they would be discussing muffin tops, and Michelle Obama would come in and be like, people just need to eat their way out of muffin top. You should be doing sit-ups. And then there'd be a blue ribbon panel, and then it would go to the state legislators, and it would be debated. There'd be a discussion eventually about an amendment on muffin top. We should ban muffin, ban 
muffin top committee. And I assure you of one thing, we'd all still have muffin top. And we wouldn't have science, and we sure wouldn't have If it were not for the United States of America being a country that for a very long time dedicated itself to economic freedom. Now, I'm not saying Spanx kills <coughs> the world, but let me tell you something. When you talk about the 1% and the greedy and all these terrible people, and oh, aren't they nasty and aren't they terrible? What's wrong with a woman that worked hard and invented something that people wanted and they'd be here for it? My personal philosophy is this. If a woman can take 10 inches off my waist, I am happy to put 10 zeros behind her net worth. People don't become rich by accident. Some do, by luck, there is the lottery. But wealth that has been created in America, 80% of it has come from the middle class, and 80% of it is created in one generation, meaning people born into the middle class create that wealth in their lifetime. And that wealth which is passed on to children is private property. Why do we look down and disdain people who inherit money? That's ridiculous. Somebody worked for that money, it was their private property, when you own a private property, whether it be money or houses or whatever private property you own, in America, we protect your right to private property. And you're going to see that it's one of the key components of economic freedom. Okay? You're going to see how that plays out, that when we attack inheritance, when we do things like the death tax, when we demonize the wealthy and set class warfare, we are setting ourselves up for a terrible life, a decrease in the standard of living, and quite frankly, quite frankly, a slow decline that will inevitably end not peacefully. And it never does when you do this. The people who live in those countries in column B, their lives are not peaceful, and they're not safe, and they're not healthy, and you're going to see that. These are five factors of economic freedom. The size of your government, the regulations which your government puts forth, sound monetary policy, free trade, and rule of law. And I'll just briefly tell you, the size of the government is crucial to economic freedom. The reason when we wrote the United States Constitution that we restrained our government was very simple. The rights of individuals and their amount of freedom increases as the size of government decreases. The more government you have, the less money you have in your pocket. The money has to go to support the government. The less money you have, the less power and voice you have. You cannot buy yourself things, you cannot buy yourself time, you cannot put your money towards a political cause to have your voice heard because it's going to pay a bureaucracy which then rules the political class. We live in this world today, more and more. The size of government is crucial. It's not limited government just because we're conservatives we believe in limited government. There's a fundamental principle. We keep government in its rightful place so that our rights are protected. Regulations. In our country right now, we live in a time of regulatory excess that is devastating to small businesses and entrepreneurs. I seriously doubt women like Sarah Blakely or others could get ahead today, and you'll see why. We have dropped. We have dropped precipitously. It is killing job creation. And by the way, Sarah Blakely and Oprah have created thousands upon thousands of jobs doing what they did without government. Governments don't create. Sound money is obviously that you have a dollar that is not depreciating because of your excessive levels of debt. The more debt you have, the more money you have on the street, the more people buy it. America's very lucky right now. We are the world's reserved currency, which means anytime nations want to exchange or sell goods to each other, they do it in dollars. People have to buy our money. If that ever came unhinged, our dollars would become useless because the dollar would just be another currency. No one would have to buy it to do free trade. It would be a very dangerous situation. Free trade is the other issue. It's very important in America. We've always been committed to that. And of course, the rule of law. We have the United States Constitution. It's our rule of law. Going back to the ancient Greeks, societies which follow the rule of law and stick as close to them as possible are the societies that are the most successful and last the longest throughout time. It is when they deviate from that rule of law that those societies start to fail and falter and disappear. And we know they do. They do. So that's important. I always love when they, everybody wants to change and rewrite the Constitution. The farther you remove away from that, the more likely you are to see what we do and what we are as Americans disappear. So the benefit of economic freedom, well, don't take my word for it. I mean, I like my spats. I'm not going to lie. I like my washing machine. 
I mean, even I have front loaders, so it's like painful for me to, I'm like, oh, I have to bend down and it's here. Like, I want like just something that like a hang. They gotta get a way to just get it out of the basket for me. Then I'll really be happy. So don't take my word for it, because maybe I'm just one of these lady, gr lazy, greedy one percenters. I'm not a one percenter, but I sure am working hard to get there. However, there are actually indexes that measure nations and their economic freedom based, based on those five factors. And the, the, the organization is called Economic Freedom of the World. It's an annual report by the Fraser Institute, which is committed to free markets. So just look. So column A and column B, remember the countries I showed you. Here is the difference in how they live, okay? When they measure life satisfaction, it's based on a number of different indicators. The most free nations in the world on a scale of um, one to nine, seven and a half for people living in the most free countries like America, and the 4.7 for those living in non-economically free. Greater life expectancy, and this is, by the way, low because we've merged in other nations that are considered in the top half of economically free. We live to about 83. Women live longer, by the way. The least free, they die at 60, and that's average, which means a lot of them die younger. Can you imagine dying, like, you only were expected your life to be 60. Only 60 years old. I mean, in today's society, people don't even start. The environment, you know, the left loves to chest stop over the environment. Oh man, I'm for the trees and the rivers. Well, not really, because in these countries where there is not economic freedom, the indicators for the environment, the environment's very bad. The pollution's high, there are no regulations appropriately managing it, and in the most free, it's better. And of course, infant mortality. For every 1,000 live births, 70 children die in those third world nations. 70 children. Birth control will not solve that. Not going to solve it. Because for every thousand births, not births per minute, just every thousand children, 70 of them are going to lose their lives. There is nothing birth control can do to save that. So where is America on economic freedom? In 2000, we were pretty good. Size of government, our government was too big. Okay. Property rights, which is the underpinning of economic freedom. We were all right, we were in the top 10. Sound money and regulation, we were excellent. Free trade, 25. That's not terrible. Okay, that wasn't, we were all right. Today, the picture and the clouds dark. It's getting worse. We are losing our freedom. We are losing the foundation of our society and it's crumbling. We are 54th on the size of government. Look at where we have regulations, property rights. We're losing our property rights. You lose property rights, it's, how it, it's the underpinning of society. And for the feminists who are inevitably rallying on about gender equality. In, and these are boring charts, but I just wanted to put them on. The U, UN Gender Inequality Index and the Fraser Institute both show every country at the bottom on economic freedom is at the bottom on the way they treat women. Go on to Amnesty International. First, get a list of all the countries that are at the bottom on economic freedom. Then go over to Amnesty International and go look at the abuses and the horrors facing women and their children. Do not tell me socialistic, big government, big regulation is in any way positive for a woman, a man, or a child. These women are living in refugee camps, being raped, being murdered, they can't get justice, they can't get food. They get with their babies in their arms while they die of diseases that we wiped out 100 years ago. And these smug liberals sit here and lecture <laughs> on free birth control. They are outrageous and immoral. They don't know what they're speaking of. Just look up Chad. You'll, you'll be appalled. It's disgusting that people continue to sell ideology that actually kills people. So what is free market feminism? Free market feminism, number one, we love men. Men are awesome. And they're important. And free market feminism is about choosing what you want and promoting the ideas of individual liberty and personal responsibility for everyone. You want birth control? Go out and buy it. Period. And it doesn't mean that we don't take care of the sick or the needy. I know there was a question of birth control for women who have illnesses. It's not birth control then. It's a hormone. It's an estrogen. And it's called a medicine. There's a difference. There's a difference. And no one is denying the needy in America. We've always had programs for the needy. Medicaid. 
But giving women free birth control is outrageous. It's not the role or the function of government, and it's not their job. It's your job. So feminism now, the people who rode the backs on hating men and thinking men are useless, and one of the leaders of the movement, I've really done saying, men are, women need a man like a fish needs a bicycle, are the same women now that are boo-hooing and flinging themselves all around for their big government to be their big daddy. Oh, you, I want you to give my birth control and my abortion. I mean, it's ridiculous. And the whole idea of the standard flock controversy was because a board of men, a board of men held a hearing on religious liberties and no girls were invited. Well, boo-hoo. I'd rather a board of men dedicated to freedom, deciding things for me in Washington, than a board of left-wing women any day. I don't care what your gender is. I care what your principles are. So there's a million boards down in Washington. The National Labor Relations Board, which has been given free reign over our country these days, which is all staffed by men, and it's a big, liberal, left-wing board. There are none of the death panels out of Obamacare. All men. All these things. All, all filled with men. It is ridiculous. It is not what your gender is or your skin color is sitting on the board. What are your principles? And you who believe in freedom need to fight back when gender, race, class, warfare comes up. Don't engage. Just be like, fine, whatever. Where do you stand on the issue? I don't care where you stand on someone's, well, Here's the deal. It shouldn't matter what their color, race, gender, creed, class is. What matters is, is what you're standing for protecting everybody's individual freedom. And that, my friends, is free market feminism. In a nutshell, there's more. I have gone on pretty long, and I usually like to open it up for questions and comments, and I know a lot of people do tend to be like, well, what about this and what about that? But I do want to say one thing. Going back, I think the best thing you can look at and understand is why these five indicators are so crucial to everything we know and are as Americans. And it was only because of these things that we went from a nation who, where women were invisible, or we, where human beings were considered property or not entity with slavery, to what we are today. This is what helps make the difference. Because we had, we start, we had the freedom and we expanded it. The arc of the universe tends towards justice. So I want to open it up to some questions um, for all of you. Challenges, comments. I know last time I was here, I got called a yeah. goddamn idiot. Last night I was going about the belief I'm talking about. Believe me, I can take it. Whatever you ask. Go ahead. choice, a 
around economic freedom, their heads pop off. And they try to turn an argument about economics and freedom into one about abortion because they're not really for women, they're for abortion. That's their thing. Which, in America, that's certainly their right to go out and talk about that. But we're not talking about abortion. So you can tell them less than 2 million women have an abortion. 62, millions get, 62 million women get in their car every day and commute to work. So why don't we talk about the regulatory effect that has driven up gas prices? Why don't we talk about the cost for women to buy a house? Why don't we talk about the millions of women, 47% of which make up the workforce? Talk about the issues that affect women. Why, <coughs> Jennifer, do you think uh, feminists are so fixated on abortion and pretty much perfunctory about everything else? Why this fixation on abortion? What's the, the heart of that? Well, feminists are frauds if they come out and say they're for women. That's number one, because they're frauds. If you're really for women, then you are discussing these issues. So it's a fraudulent nature because that's their issue. I cannot question motives and go into um, a woman's mind as to why she would go out and promote abortion. That's her thing. To base the crux of your argument that what you're doing is somehow good for women is a level of fraudulency that is truly under me. It, it, it's just unconscionable. So you'll have to ask one of them why they spend their lives pretending to care about women while at the same time talking about abortion. Less than two million. And, I, and by the way, when did birth control become a women's issue? Correct me if I'm wrong. How do you have a baby, man, woman? So why is it a woman's issue? Right. It's not a woman's issue. If you're birth, men, it takes a man and a woman to have a baby, which some, some, some wise and high always jumps up like, wow, great one in the test tube, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I get that. But in general, you need a man and a woman. So this is not a woman's issue. Personal responsibility is a man and a woman's issue. It's their decision. I just wanted to bring up two things. Um, first, if a baby is aborted and it's a woman, isn't that going against women's rights, aborting the baby and not giving them the right to life? If you ask a feminist that, at that point, they will personally attack you. <laughs> I have learned this. Every time I have debated um, and brought up a point which, you know, I always find it remarkable that um, liberals always believe in the right to free speech until someone who doesn't agree with them starts to speak freely, and then they're just hard. <laughs> you will get personally attacked for questions like that. It's a fair question in a debate. It's a fair question. They will excoriate you up one side and down the other because you're a man. They will excoriate you up one side and down the other because you're a conservative, and they'll probably find 700 other ways to excoriate you based on your race, class, gender, creed, and anything else they can identify about you, including the color of your tie and your weight of shoes. So take it, because let them, by attacking you personally, they create paint who they are, not you. And then go back to the question. And never relent on it. Never relent on it. You will be tearing down for that question, especially as a young man. But keep asking it. And refuse to take the bait if they try and make it about race, class, gender, creed, etc. Yeah. Okay, so um, just a quick question about abortion. Okay, so um, since um, you know, the government standing behind them, Planned Parenthood, and what does that say about some, um, one, the moral character of, um, of the leaders saying these things, and does, and do they really value life? Do they really value life? Do they really value life? I mean, if you value life, if you value life, then you, there is no country on earth that wrote in the, I really believe this, I'm so pro-American to the point, and it's not just because I was born, but like, what we did for this world, the way we have tried and, and, and overcome and triumphed, all men are created equal. If you are defending that, you can't have liberty without life. So if at any point you're okay with taking innocent lives, you're not for liberty, which means you're not for America. You undercut the entire underpinning. Before you go out and start chest thumbing for liberty in America, you better first chest thumb for life in every shape and form it comes. Weak, strong, whatever. Whether, it li whether we live for five minutes, five years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, whether we live strong or live weak or live incapacitated. If you're not out defending that, you don't care about anything else. I want to hear your mouth on it. And that's what I said. And these politicians do. And, and, so yes. Do not do any level of education, and we 
we all step into the debate with that. We could not have more, and I'm not speaking for Republicans, I'm speaking just those of us who believe in liberty, right? You know, when you are going to go out and talk about an issue, I need to remind you of this, and this is the greatest failure of people who believe in liberty. You are not going out to convince yourself. You are not going out to convince your friends who think like you. It doesn't matter what you think. Nobody cares. It's what they think. And when I say they, I mean the people who aren't understanding, who don't automatically agree with this, who might be pro-choice or pro-socialist. Your job is not to convert the same. Your job is to convert those who don't agree. Now, in America, here's, here's an interesting thing. If on a scale of like 1 to 10, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, all Americans are going to be rated in terms of their political lean. So, you know, one is being hardcore communist leftist, right, anarchist, and ten being George Washington himself, right? So we, you, we fall into this category, I would say, uh, eight to ten, or seven to ten, that's, that's us, right, seven to ten. Stop talking like you're talking to the seven to ten. They already agree. They're already going to go your way on the issue. Stop. Stop talking to them. And stop really talking to the ones to fours. The ones to fours are like you, but on the end of like communism, right? They're not, they are, this is who they are. But all they're in the middle. They're in the middle. The five, sixes, and sevens. Whatever number I don't, I can't remember what. The five, sixes, and sevens. These are the people that decide everything about our nation. These five, sixes, and sevens are not as politically aware as the ones, as say the ones, the threes, and the, the sevens, or whatever, eight to ten, right? So what they, they have. These four to sevens determine everything. And the, the ones, the left, just talk to them in a way that makes sense. That's why they don't like to debate facts because they don't want to let them know the truth. They'd rather say the Republicans hate women, they didn't let a woman testify, oh my gosh, they hate women, they're going to take our birth control. In the noise that we live in the world, what comes out is, problem with women, Republicans don't want to have birth control. That's crazy, why would someone want that? Meanwhile, if we would have messaged that right, we would have never touched that. You don't want, there's very, specific things they hear. When you go out and you talk about an issue, you've got to talk like you are talking to people who don't know all that you do, who don't use the same language. We might talk in the, in the words of liberty and freedom. If I were in another group, I might not use those words. I might talk about taxes, and I might talk about income, because that's the word that they use. And if you're going before a group of people who don't know anything about any of this, my Uncle Bob, I always, my, I have two people, Uncle Bob, my Uncle Bob called me, he said, Jen, I'm on class. He goes, Jen, I'm going to tell you something. He said, your hair looks real nice, but I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. He goes, left, right, Republican, Democrat, what, what does this mean? He's like, what does it mean? He's like, I don't understand. Now, my uncle, he does not have college education, but he's a sad man, a street star man, born fall out the cop. But he's like, what? He's like, I, I like what you say, but I don't understand what all those words mean. What, what's the difference? The reason we lose is because we don't pay attention to all the bottom. And the, the, they do. They know Uncle Bob is the one deciding the nation for us. And they talk to him. And what they say, he hears, even though they lie. And that's why they win. So we gotta stop. Okay, I have a question. Um, in my class yesterday, I tried talking about how it was Americans' right and you know, it was our duty in order to try to help women and, you know, oppressed peoples in other parts of the world try to get, you know, more freedom. And I was told that it was not our duty to do that. And it seems to me that with capitalism, women can have that ability in other countries. You know, they can, you know, become more free with capitalism. But how would you recommend uh, going and spreading capitalism to those other countries? Because um, many of the kids in my class are very against doing anything with other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, in countries like we were talking about, it's very difficult. And I know a lot of people do. That's a great question and very interesting. Um, let me just go back to oh, I hate, uh, the countries. The reason you're not going to 
drug capitalism in these countries because they're run by, it's the same reason you can't feed them or, or the struggle with, with, with giving them even basic needs, basic needs. And it's their government. And to, to go in and to just suddenly change that over as Americans, as outsiders, is incredibly different, difficult. I mean, these are countries perpetually at war where the majority of people are like, chat. I mean, just really, go to Amnesty International. I just did a speech on chat. You read about the way these people live, the way the women live in refugee camps, being raped, and they cannot get justice. And if they come forward and try to get justice, a lot of them are murdered by the government because they try to get justice. I mean, it's their fault they got raped. They get killed. I mean, that's, that's how these things go. I think what you want to do, and what you need to remember, is that Americans can spread the idea of capitalism and freedom. It, it's everywhere in the world. Before there was the internet, before there was Twitter, before there was Facebook, before there was television, people knew about America. They knew about us. They knew where freedom was, and they sacrificed everything to get here. They left lands with no money. No language skills to come to America. They knew about us. That freedom, it rings throughout the world. Now, you might not be able to deliver capitalism to Chad, but they know where freedom is. The greatest thing for you to do for them is keep that city on a hill alive. You have to keep this alive. This is the last hope for humanity forever since we started. They came to us. How dare we? Tam that down. How dare we kill the dreams of millions of people by allowing this country to go down this path? You spread capitalism by protecting what is here, by making America go back and recognize what held her up as that city on the hill. Man, that's how you spread capitalism. I think the answer is foreign policy. As I mentioned in my introduction, Rush Limbaugh was attacked by the mainstream media when he made a comment calling the woman from Georgetown asking for free birth control a slut. But Bill Maher, was, nothing was said about him from the media for calling Sarah Palin the C-word, which I consider to be a much more derogatory term. No feminist group came out against Bill Maher, but they all came out against Rush Limbaugh. And Gloria Stein was his guest. So was Debbie <laughs> Washman's fault, and so was Nancy Pelosi all Democratic women, because these are the biggest frauds and hypocrites that ever walked the face of the earth. Spare me your faux moral outrage over the word slut. Stop pretending, stop being on bended knee to the government and behaving, like, I'm sorry. I'm a woman and here's what I'm gonna say, you look ridiculous. Stop acting like women are on bended knee to the government in need of birth control and abortion. Make it look like one, knock it off. It's crap, don't own it. I'm not outraged by being called a slut. I'm outraged that you're trying to take away my freedom. Call me whatever the hell you want. Baby on the facts. All right. I mean, it's ridiculous. We shouldn't own it. Faux outrage. I have no tolerance for it. I don't care. Call me. You, if you go look at my Twitter account and the name, same words, I have been constant every day of my life. So what? It, when people do that to you, it defines them, not you. It's none of my business what other people think of me, and it's none of your business what other people think of you. And we should have never gotten into that to be. I believe in free speech. Say what you want. I just want to. Let Bill Maher say what he wants. And call them out as frauds and hypocrites. I just want to bring up what do you think it says about the feminist agenda when they attack Russ Limbaugh for calling her a slut, but not Bill Maher for calling Sarah Palin the C word? They're hypocrites who care about abortion and don't care about women. Gloria Steinem, Nancy Pelosi, Debbie Washer Jones are frauds. They are hypocrites. <laughs> and they do not care about women. I revoked their gender card. See, see, see what I do. Revoke. They don't play it. Take your gender card and go someplace else. Revoke. They don't get to play the gender card. Here's why. I'm a woman, you don't speak for me, therefore, me as one individual may revoke that gender card. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Try, Star Parker is a great example. Do you think any feminist would sing the praises of that woman? Do you think the NAACP would invite her to speak at an event? No. Get real. They spit on her. They spit, and they spit on her because she doesn't agree with their agenda. And she's a woman, and she's an African-American. They spit on her. They would only embrace her 
groups, races, and classes of people. Don't let them do it. Call me whatever you want. But you will never beat me. Here's what I said. I called Nancy Pelosi. I wanted to testify in front of Congress, too, because I don't know what I'm trying to point that out. Like, I'm a woman, too. It's okay. In the arena of ideas, we pull them into the arena of ideas and debate them. They cannot win, and they will hide. And that's all you go after them for. Let them say slack. Go after them every day, all the time. Facts, reason, and logic. They are unworthy to compete in their arena of ideas. That's why they do personal attacks. Don't, don't worry. I support Rosh Limbaugh's right to say slut, and I support Bill's mom's right to say slut. There you go, boys. Not gonna have that video out, send it to Bill and Rush. Tell him I said it was okay. <laughs> are there any more questions, anybody? And by the way, I do not support for like my own children or myself, bad manners and bad form. Like I said, I support people's right to say it, it defines who and what you are. So when you're going after people, be sure you're defeating them on facts, logic, and reason. Then you're a worthy adversary. Then you define yourself. You have to call somebody a name. Get out of the game. You can't win. <laughs> okay. Thanks for coming out. Guys, we appreciate awesome. your speech.